This podcast is brought to you by Onnit. Go to onnit.com and look at the great selection of supplements. If you find something you like, press in code Joey and get 10% off delivered right to your house. What's happened, you bad motherfuckers? It's Monday, the 17th of the month. And in honor of 420, Uncle Joey's joint is brought to you by Freeze Pipe. The best bongs in the fucking market. How do I know? Because I've been smoking since I've been in fucking diapers. Get ready to smoke without throat burn for the coldest, smoothest fucking smoking experience you've ever had. Get a freezable pipe, bubbler, or bong from the freeze pipe. The secret is this. It's the glycerin chamber. Pop that baby in a freezer for an hour and watch as you smoke. It's cooled by 300 degrees. Listen, guys, you know me, dog. I love my little bongs and when it comes to freeze pipe whether it's the bubbler whether it's the bong whether it's the pipe and now the tornado which is fucking tremendous 420 is here and freeze pipe biggest sale of the year is about to end that's right it's the cannabis christmas and you can save up to 40 dollars on select pipes bubblers bongs and more visit freezepipe.com and find your new favorite piece use something like that's not on sale use code diaz and save 10 percent on your entire order again that's freezepipe.com use code diaz for 10 percent off your entire order or shop the 420 sale guys enjoy and smoke yourself until it comes out of your fucking ears you understand me the joint is also brought to you by bam liquid iv listen Festival season's coming up for you young bucks. After days of booze in the desert, stinky feet and weirdos breathing on you, you're going to need to refuel. Liquid IV has you covered. Just one stick and you're going to get five essential vitamins and it hydrates you quicker than water alone. Two times faster than water alone. It even has three times the electrical lights of traditional sports drinks and it comes in 12 delicious flavors like sea berry, oh my god, strawberry lemon, a tremendous pina colada fucking blow your wig off and you know me concord grape i'm still slinging dick like uncle joey that's my personal favorite is the concord grape and the fucking cherry and the tropical punch oh my god liquid iv has five essential vitamins you need to fuel you best b3 b5 b6 b12 and vitamin c it's also non-gmo non-gluten dairy and soy free so do me a favor you could grab your liquid IV in bulk at Nationwide at Costco or guess what you get 20% off when you hang out with your Uncle Joey so go to liquidiv.com use code Joey at checkout J-O-E-Y that's 20% off anything you order when you shop better hydration today using promo code Joey at liquidiv.com alright I got liquid IV and I got uh, whatever the fuck it's time to sling some dick. Let's get this podcast started. Hey, how you doing? Come on in. Yeah, Joey's in the back. Check one, two. Welcome to Uncle Joey's Joint. What's happening, you beautiful savages? It's Monday, the 17th of April. Unbelievable. We got a great week coming up. We got 420, the celebration of fucking potheads. <laughs> so Thursday, we'll be, we'll be walking around like fucking Dawn of the Dead all <laughs> gacked the fuck up, playing, paying $100 per joint in New York City. But it's good. It's fun. Hopefully, we'll have some great weather. And that's it. Uh, we got a whole new week with a whole new fucking set of rules. It's a Monday motivation. This Monday, ready for this? We got a fucking guest. Dun, 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 dun. 
the <laughs> author of Tremendous Miss Erica Motherfucking Florentine. Woo, Thank hi. you for coming on. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited. I'm happy that you're here yes. and stuff. I wanted just to ask you some questions to give people. We wrote a book together. I talked. She wrote it and put it together. She's the real mastermind behind the book. Mm -hmm. uh, we released it May 2nd. You know, we've been working on it for two fucking years. Before I met you, I was making notes for 10 years, didn't know what to do. And it was just the uh, perfect collaboration. You know, it's funny. Just to let you know, this was a very hard book to write because it just wasn't one element. There were so many elements of this book. There's a, just to let you guys know about L.A., how I tell people that they don't know dick about dick. I was stuck for years trying to write this book, and there's a lady who advertises huge, huge in the writing community in L.A. Like, just, she spends tons of money on advertising, a goal is to help me finish writing your book. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> she charges you this much. And it's very, I'm very reasonable. I finally <laughs> contacted her like about a year before I came here. I was stuck. And she was mutual friends with an uh, uh, acting coach, Ivana Chubbuck, that had a lot of mm -hmm. programs working through her school. So I contacted her, met her for lunch. You know, she showed up like with fucking three assistants. You know, <laughs> one the whole yeah. I mean, it was guys. It was one to hold coffee, the other one to hold the dog, and the other one to hold the phone. And listen, I wish I was exaggerating. I wish I was fucking lying to you people. It was like sitting with her. And meanwhile, she had to be tipping the scales at four hundred. She had like a donut, a crumb bun, and a fucking Starbucks that looked like a fucking tub of ice cream. You could and three assistants. And she was talking to me and then going, uh, hold on, send uh, Johnny a text. Send Johnny Depp a text. I'll meet him for lunch on Thursday. And then, uh, Amelia, watch him with Fifi, you know. And, uh, oh, the coffee, I don't understand. Put some more. It was, it was fucking, it, I thought I was getting put on. Like, I thought, and I, it was like 500 for the fucking consultation. Like, just to meet where it was 500 bucks for this fucking, you know, limo. And you're like, what the fuck? And she read. I spoke to her. She called me a week later. And she goes, after much discussion with my colleagues, you either have to pick this. You have to pick a subject here. We cannot do the criminality and the comedy and the cocaine, the kidnapping. It will not work, you know, with the... Yeah. And I was like, okay, thank you for your time. And then she tried to give me an ear beat and, like... You know, if you wanted to work, I'd have to mm -hmm. refer you to myself. It would have to be like a three-woman project, and I would need nine assistants, you know, <laughs> one to, to sharpen my pencil. I mean, it was fucking comical. I still see this lady putting ads out. I just, I'm telling you this because I want you to really understand what you did. I still see this lady putting ads up. I still get emails from her. Come to my workshop, how to write a book in three days. You know what yeah. I'm saying? Yeah. It's a fucking, that's just to let yes. you know. I went through, you know, I was first I signed with an agent out of New York. And it was, you're not even going to believe this shit, guys. Because we don't, you know, it's like I tell Mike some stories sometimes. He's like, how come I didn't know that? Because, Mike, <laughs> I was going through so much at the time. I never had time to tell people how hard it was to put this book together. First, I had a guy that was a consultant. He, oh, he was this guy didn't even write with a pen. He still had a feather. You know, he wrote the doc. This guy wrote everything. He wrote the Declaration of Independence. He wrote everything. I mean, if you listen to him, you know, he helped this guy with the script. You know, it was a fucking nightmare. The nobody. He would tell me nobody wants to hear about the criminality. Mm. Nobody wants to hear about the cocaine. Nobody. I mean, it was fucking sad. I had that guy. And he would rewrite all my shit and send it back to me. And it sounded like my book was getting written by Robin Hood. <laughs> like, I went to the Valley of the Darkness. In. There's no darkness in Jersey, motherfucker. <laughs> you sound like a poet. You guys just have no idea. This went on and on. Then I got a book agent that was going to put me with two writers. Those two writers were god-awful. One guy showed up with flip-flops, and he was picking his toes while he was talking to me on 43rd Street and 8th one time at a coffee shop, picking his toes with the fucking pen, okay? 
I don't know. And he was like sniffing it, and then he would go deep in his toe. <laughs> Even I don't do that shit in public. In public, I do it in private. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> so then I have a comedy showcase, and he goes, "I want to bring the book office to the comedy showcase at the stand. This is the old stand." Yeah. Erica. He comes in looking like you did today, beautiful, and within minutes he looks like Uncle Dan. <laughs> He's disheveled. He's got two beers in his hand. He's talking about the next covering. I'm like, what are you talking about? The next thing you know, I, I try to get him out of the comedy club. And he goes, come on, let's go next door to a bar. I know these people. He goes next door. The, he asked the bartender for a drink. You could tell the, he annoyed the people there. Mm. The bartender just turned his head and went the other way. <laughs> you know what this motherfucker did? He went behind the bar. And started making his own cocktail. No. A fight broke out in this bar. And here I am by the stand. I have no idea where I am. And there's a fight in this fucking bar because the guy I walked in there with <laughs> decided to go behind the bar and make his own fucking drink. Then they called the stand and they said shit about me, which even the people were like, he didn't do anything. He was, he was, I wasn't even drinking. I don't even drink. That was what I went through. It was constant. It's crazy. It was constant. Then I had people who would just contact me, like the podcast. Go, I'm a writer, and I live in San Diego. I had a girl who was committed. I'm doing this. Disappeared. Crazy. Disappeared. Then I had another girl who was tall. Oh, went to uh, what's the big school they all go to in L.A. At CSU. What is it? Uh, uh, USC. USC. Or, yeah, yeah, yeah. USC. I was a valedictorian, you know. Yeah. I created the Kardashians. You yeah. know. Oh, my God. She wanted me to write the book, but doing one-man shows. So every week, I would have to go on stage at the fucking, at the something theater, right next to a weed store. I still get emails from this loser theater. Mm -hmm. They do like Halloween shows all year round. The guy's like a ghoul fest. Like he's into yeah. ghouls and shit. <laughs> Can I, you have, I'm sorry I'm fucking taking from your time, Erica. But I just wanted to show you how valuable you were to me. I appreciate that. I mean, I think the thing is a lot of people say that they're writers. And a lot of people, unfortunately are not writers. Now, I'm not saying I'm the best in the world, right? Everyone has lots of things to learn still, but I have come across so many people who tell me they're an expert writer and they've done all these sorts of things, and then you have them do a two-pager to give you a sense of what their style is, and it's, it's not writing. I think it's, you know what it is? It's like, um, I would say right around the time I was graduating college, probably like 2009 time frame, blogs became so big. So anyone with a keyboard could Correct. be a writer, right? And if you had some sort of degree that matched, could match with it, you didn't necessarily have to have a journalism degree. You can have some sort of communications degree in general or maybe even not. And you can just market yourself as a writer. And, uh, you know, it's also funny, too. I'm thinking of all these people who claim that they can write these books. I've seen, so now I've been ghostwriting books for a few years. And if you do a Google search, people will say, oh, I'll write your book for $500. How are you going to write somebody's book for $500? That's not a quality piece of work that you're going to get for that. But, yeah, they just market themselves that way and then upsell you on things that have nothing to do with writing. It's a, it's a whole thing. At the end of the day, I always think if someone's trying especially to pull a memoir together, their important life stories, you have to work with somebody who is on the same train of thought as you, who's not going to guide you away from, don't tell your criminal stories. Those are part of your story. You know, somebody telling you not to tell that is silly. They don't know your audience. Your people love your criminal story. I mean, come on. And also, I've shared bits and pieces just within my close circle, people that aren't familiar with some of your criminal stories or other things in your past that have read it and they're like, I cannot wait to read the rest of how this is going to play out. I told some of my friends, I'm like, you know, there's one chapter, it's called The Kidnapping. And they're like, what do you mean? We can't wait to see what The Kidnapping is about. You know, like people are living for this. And, uh, you know, anyone who would guide you away from telling important stories are just silly. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I just, I was in LA, look, right now I live 
conflicted because I have all this comedy knowledge, you know, and I love to sit with people and help them. But the problem is you have, I have to decipher, and it's very hard to tell somebody this, and it's very hard to charge somebody money for this. When you pass on this type of stuff, you're doing it as a labor of love. Mm -hmm. And there's a, too much of that in LA, that people are inexperienced. There's too much of that in New York. There's too much of that anywhere. Mm -hmm where people are inexperienced and they, they teach workshops or mm -hmm. something like that. Yeah. And it it frustrates you as because the most frustrating thing is to want help. You don't want somebody to do it for me. Eric, I don't want somebody to do it for me. I just need guidance and mm -hmm. help, and, and you're not going to find that mm -hmm. a lot of time. You're not going to find quality guidance. And I know from stand-up. Mm -hmm. With stand-up, I went through 20 agents. And then I realized, guess who the best agent was? Me. Mm -hmm. So I would hustle roles, you know, based on Pete. What do you got? Oh, Joy, I went for this audition. They're looking for you at this audition. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't even tell my agent. I would just do it on yeah. my own, you <laughs> yeah, know? Yeah, yeah. Because it's, it's a waste of time. But what I'm trying to get to is it's so weird when people are looking to do something. The quickest path is to just do it themselves until, and that opens up those doors. Mm -hmm. I enjoyed the blogging. When the blogging first came out, that opened my, that was the first storytelling I had on MySpace. Mm -hmm. I would do the Monday morning blog way before podcasts came up. You got to find them. The first five of them were God awful because I had never written. Like I, the only thing I had ever written was I'm driving down the road mm -hmm. and all of a sudden I think about a joke and you write on a piece of napkin, like keywords and the jokes so you remember it. But I hadn't mm -hmm. written longhand, you know, like the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Oh my God, I remember like two of them going, to, and people were like, Joey, you got to go back to school. Your pronunciation, you're not stopping. <laughs> too many commas. It was God awful. It's a process. You're just not going to get up off the boat and fucking write. And I realized, honest to God, whatever advance they gave us for this book, mm -hmm. I already spent mine. Mm -hmm. I already gave it to Gene Perret mm -hmm. and all those other writers that wrote how to write books. Mm -hmm. I would spend my, I gave Samuel French $60,000 easy over mm -hmm. the years mm -hmm. with comedy books and comedy writing books and mm -hmm. how to write and how to write comedy. And and the thing is, if you're going to write a book and try to sell it, at least I would write the book, I would buy the book, 25 bucks, read two chapters, but I would miss what they were saying. Mm -hmm. To write, you have to write every day. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. You're not going to learn how to write. It's like jujitsu. You can watch all the instructional videos you want. Eventually, you're going to have to get on your back and start fucking wrestling motherfuckers. Yeah. And it's the same thing with writing. And I didn't know. Mm -hmm. I would write comedy thinking, I'm doing what Gene Perrette told me and all these mm -hmm. other great writers. If you're not writing, writing is the, you don't even need a book. You don't even need to buy Gene Perrette's book or uh erica florentine's book on how to write you don't need mm -hmm. to if you write every day if you get a fucking notebook and just go i'm gonna write a page every goddamn day in five years you'll become a great writer mm -hmm. just all the it's all point to that i fully agree with you i always say when people come to me and say you know i, I really want to learn how to write on my own um and i i want you to give me the guidance but i don't want you to actually do the content for me just help give me any advice you have and i always start with that just write. Just even if it makes no sense, just put pen to paper or type it or whatever you want to do with it. Just write and write and write and do it every single day. And I'll, I'll be honest, I still, I've been writing my entire career and I still take writer's workshops. I'm doing one currently. I just, because it's helpful to continue to write every single day and then also get people's feedback. Like I'm always doing those sorts of things unrelated to my projects because it helps it really, really helps. It's the only way that you're going to be able to start making any sort of progress. But I agree. There's tons and tons of information out there. How to be a writer. And uh, <laughs> you'll spend a million dollars in books. How to be a comic. How to be a musician. How to yeah. be a guitarist. How to draw. Yeah. You'll drop millions yeah. of dollars buying and searching for the answer. And that online courses that people are selling. Yes. Yes. Like, like what? Like hotcakes. They're just going. They're really? Like how to draw, how to mm -hmm. act, how to whatever. Now, when I was a kid, you joined the fucking drawing contest, remember? You drew a yeah. picture of a parrot, <laughs> and if you won, you won $500. And, and, and no, you didn't win any money. Mm. 
they sent you five hundred dollars in Etzels and all the different shit. Yeah, yeah, like yeah. Yeah, yeah. I trust me, I drew that parrot a few times. <laughs> That's why I became a comic, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> it's great. I, I I love learning. I love reading about somebody like I always love fucking the Spielberg book on writing, mm-hmm. you know. I think that's just just to hear the Carrie story, that's like, mm-hmm. yeah, that yeah. all those books. I, I and I would get jealous. I would buy those books, read them, and then <laughs> yeah. fuck you, Stephen King. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> you motherfucker. Yeah, and it's just it's writing. You know, what college did you go to for writing? I went to University of Delaware. So no shit. I yeah, and I actually wanted to be a New York Times journalist. I wanted to write for the New York Times. So I was, I mean, on the path. I that's what I really wanted to do. And it's funny because no matter how hard you think you're learning and excelling and how hard the courses are and you think you're growing, my first job at a local newspaper took me a year to be like i can't even do local i could never do new york times i never thought about the fact that i'd have to actually ask people very difficult questions and i don't have the personality to do that so things like um i mean i should have thought about this in college when i'm so adamant on this new york times uh career path that you know let's say somebody passed away in the community tragically a teenager they would send me to the parents house to knock on the front door and get a quote from the parents a day after the child died and i i'm just my personality i'm just not cut out for that there's certain things that i can do but that was just a no for me so i worked at that newspaper for a year and at the year mark i would come home crying and I'm like, I had to go stalk the brother of this girl who just died, who did not want to speak with me. And I, I get it now, looking back, I'm like, of course, that's part of being a reporter. But I knew a year in, I'm like, if I can't do this, there's no way. I have no shot at the New York Times. <laughs> Literally no it's shot. Like yeah, I just have no shot unless they're having me write, you know, feature yeah, features on something do. yeah uh so then i was like oh maybe i'll write for magazines and at the time magazines were starting to fold too i mean they have some great online magazines now but it's just not the same as it They're used to be so it's, it's so funny <laughs> it's so funny that you were saying that about uh i fucking forgot i gotta stop smoking pot in the morning <laughs> <laughs> but it's weird how you think you want to do something. This is why we were just having this conversation last night with some parents. So this gentleman was telling me how he's really fearful about his daughter going, you know, that, that kid's a little older. And he goes, Joey, my biggest fear is college. How am I going to do this? Four years, I got two kids, and they're two years apart. I'm like, I don't know. He goes, well, I make decent money. I'm a, a computer salesman, all this shit. And we were talking about the, do you really need college anymore? Mm -hmm. Do you really need college? And I've always stuck to my thing. I tried to take classes at Glassboro, Mm -hmm. you know, for money, and I quit. I I just couldn't cut it. And then on my own pace, I found myself back to Colorado Mountain College, and Mm -hmm. I was doing okay again. And that's because I took that year off. I really took that year off. And I, I still believe it's such a hard sell. It's a hard sell. I'm going to have to have a hard sell with Mercy. But my proposal is, here's the deal, Mercy. You're not going to go to college after high school. You're going to take a year off. I want you just to get a retail job. I don't give a fuck what it is. Mm-hmm. Makeup, books at Barnes & Noble, cars, it doesn't matter. Something where you have to deal with the public for one year. One year. And that year, I'll pay your car payment. I'll pay your rent, your meals, mm-hmm. whatever you earn. It's all yours. One year. Just give save me that. For college or whatever. Save. Whatever. Save but don't save. Yeah. I'm not even looking for that. I'm looking for you to, to realize what Erica realized. Mm-hmm. Erica grew up. I can't wait to be a New York Times writer. There's nothing wrong with that goal. Mm-hmm. But you didn't really plan it out. Nobody does. We're mm-hmm. fucking 16. Yeah. Who the fuck are you to put on my lap when I'm 18 yeah. that I have to pick my career decision for life? Yeah. And this is the other mistake we make also that we look at this and with our children, a lot of you are too young for that and go, what? This is going to be a hard sale for me. This is a hard sale for anybody. How can I tell Paula 
Mm-hmm. You know, your cousin, I don't go to college. Well, mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm going to take care of you. You just see, yeah. they go, no, I want to be with my friends, Dad. You know, I want to yeah. go. I want to go to college. They're going to University of Delaware. Mm-hmm. We're all in the same fraternity. But I know for a fact, if she takes that year off and just deals with people, gets to know that people are liars, people come in and go, oh, Erica, I'm definitely going to buy that car. I'll be back at three. And all of a sudden, mm-hmm. you're outside drinking coffee. You see them pulling out of the Volkswagen yeah. lot, <laughs> beeping at you. Fuck you. And you're like, what happened? People are liars. <laughs> Yeah. People are fucking liars. Oh, they ran into a salesman. Mm-hmm. You follow me? Oh, mm-hmm. they ran into a salesman. You thought you were being a salesman by being very nice. And I realized that I can never be a journalist with this podcast. I, when we used to do a lot more guests on the church, there's one guest I'm thinking about in particular. Mm-hmm. He came on and there was some friction in his life. I'm not the type of person to go, by the way, talk to me about this situation. To turn this into, because I always wanted a podcast. I'm not doing 60 minutes. Yeah. You follow me? That's where you use that type of yeah. shit. People already know that, but not really. Because when I did that podcast, people hit me up for weeks and go, we didn't like that you didn't bring that topic up with them. And I was like, a podcast for me is a happy place. Yeah. I don't want a podcast to argue with people. I don't mm-hmm. want this to start arguments with other podcasts. That's not what I do this. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I don't know where there's this, enough of that, going on. There's enough yeah. of that <laughs> shit going on. I, I just want to crack jokes and smoke dope and see your friend, you yeah. know? Yeah, yeah. But I always thought that that was brutal about me having to go, like, dig a little deeper in. Yeah. Like, confront people. I could do it on the street. That's how I. <laughs> that's how I am too. I can do it though. on the street. I am like not insane. on a podcast. I don't want to create that moment of you know yeah. what I'm saying. Unless you tell me before yeah. the podcast, bring it up because I want to talk about that. Like, yeah, that's how I. I always think. Yeah, I just my personality outside of work is very. Um, I'll ask people questions. I'm very strong personality, but when it came to doing things like that, oh. I just couldn't do it. But it's funny how you're saying you wanted to do the positive end of the conversation, and that's why I ended up switching into um, public relations and internal communications because it was all writing, but it was the positive end of it. So if you're looking at an issue, PR's the entire purpose is to figure out what's the good about this situation and let everybody know versus somebody just died. Let's go to ask their family about it or looking into the more negative aspects. I just I felt better about what the work I was doing and it's, I mean, it was sad. I used to go into New York City and take <laughs> take pictures in front of New York Times. Just, you know, <laughs> like my, I bring my friends. We, like, we had to walk in front of the New York Times and we'd have our little cameras and take pictures. And it's embarrassing, you know, but I would, that was my dream. And then it just took one year to realize it's, it's really I'm crazy. never going to be able to do that. It's really crazy while we're on the topic, what the business of news is. Mm. You know, That's yeah, so peop- people want to hear about, you know, uh, oh, my God, uh, Michael Klein is getting married to mm-hmm. Cynthia, the Philadelphia Kleins. You yeah, know, that, yeah. That's, a, that's great, you know. How many newspapers will that sell? The, the people will get married. Their families mm-hmm. want to buy the newspaper. You know, I think about Don Henley's song, Dirty Laundry, when you were saying that, mm-hmm. get the widow on the set. Mm-hmm. We need dirty laundry, yeah. you know. You know, what is the news? What has the news become and what is the fucking news? It's somewhere that we go to get information of what's going on. But you really think about it. The news has become... They're telling, they're telling you what they, you want. So 247 and WPIX. What's the first 15 minutes of the news? A kid burnt to death in Harlem. <laughs> a baby died yeah. in a house yeah. fire. Yeah. Three people have been displaced by a fire. It's all bad fucking news. Yeah. So you look at the news and go, what the fuck is this, right? Yeah. And then we have the pay channels, like your CNNs and your Fox and all those. And mm-hmm. I, I'm not politically inclined, but I know that each one represents a different, they're Democrats over there. Don Lemon's a fucking yeah. hypocrite. Yeah. He's a liberal. He's this. Yeah. And they're all doing the same thing, yeah. bashing Trump, right, mm-hmm. to get the most viewers. Like, it's it's just really crazy what the business of the news is and how either you're a news person to me i don't want to wake up to the news no ever again <laughs> ever again ever again yeah as i'm eating my cereal my captain crunch 
or whatever the fuck makes me happy. <laughs> What's the cereal that pop in the morning? Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. you listen like an idiot. Yeah. <laughs> and you listen. I don't want to hear about the three kids that burnt to death at seven in the morning before I have to leave my fucking house. So that's why I don't watch the news, right? But look at what the news has become. Like, and sometimes you watch, the, you ever be in a dentist office and you're like, mm. come back in two minutes, we're going to show you a spring casserole. And yeah. you're like, you know what? <laughs> I'm at the dentist office right now, and even if I was home, I wouldn't want to see a spring casserole on the news. But then you're like, wait a second. If the, they're going to tell me a spring casserole and the three black kids that burnt the dent in the Bronx, yeah, I'd rather get the spring the casserole. casserole. Yeah. <laughs> I'd rather get the spring casserole. So true. Yeah, I used to, because I was so, I mean, I even went to a high school for communications because I was already convinced then that I wanted to be a reporter. Um, and I would have newspaper subscriptions and I would read the news. I mean, this is so nerdy, but I really did it. I would read the news. I was so obsessed with knowing what was going on all the time. Currently, I i mean, I have what could be described sometimes as crippling anxiety. That's the last thing I need to see. To your point Me in the too. morning, I don't need to set my day into a anxiety ridden that I'm going to, I don't know, going to get shot in my supermarket. Like, I don't want to have to think about that. I, it's not that I block it all out, but... I really limit my news consumption to, and I try to keep it to just celebrity stuff. It's fun. I don't have to get stressed about it. <laughs> Even the celebrity stuff. <laughs> yeah. I look at it and I go, what's the, I don't know. If I want to hear news about something, I want to hear news about the world, happy stuff. You mm -hmm. know, I used to make fun of that, you know, eyewitness news. What's the one that we watch at 630? That all the older people watch? Uh, um, uh, yeah, I, I no, 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 ABC World News Report. Oh, right? yes, I used to watch that, yeah, too. Yeah, I used to yeah, watch that, too. Yeah. The pandemic destroyed me. That, mm -hmm. that, that destroyed me. And I used to always make fun of it and go, I got to wait till the last 15 seconds where they show you the blind kid that plays Beethoven to yeah. make you happy. Like, <laughs> yeah. here's this blind kid playing <laughs> Beethoven. And you're like, oh, my God. <laughs> you're like, okay, yeah. we're back. But yeah. it's true. They give, <laughs> so yeah. after you just tortured me for 28 minutes. Mm -hmm. of bad news, how we're going to get the worst snow report this year, the, the stock market's going to go down, yeah. interest rates are going up. Now you're going to go, oh, now we're going to show you a happy story from Iowa. Yeah. The kid with one eye who plays <laughs> ping pong. What, and then, you know, you, an eye. yeah, with yeah. one eye. And shit. The eye. <laughs> <laughs> it's just fucking crazy, man. So when, after the newspaper stuff, what was your next... Uh, yeah so then i like i said i was like you know what public relations is the total opposite of what i was currently doing so i started looking into it and i got a um really lucky to get a fellowship with johnson and johnson and Rutgers. and johnson and johnson brought me into their communications team and i was doing pr and comms and i was just writing all day and it was the best so i was like all right here we go here's a career that i can you know, be into. It's good stuff every day. It's fun. I still get to interview people, but it's not, I'm not looking for negative answers. I'm actually looking for what's going on that's great in their life. And from there, I did that for quite a while. I've worked in uh, different PR agencies in the city and it was awesome. I, I really loved it. I just, at a certain point, corporate America, after 10 years of it, I was just... Not That's a complete loving it different. Anymore. That's a complete different situation, <laughs> especially when you're a writer. Hold on one second. I'm gonna break the commercial break, and then we'll come back and we'll finish this up. And now for a word from our sponsors, cocksuckers. Thank you for taking a minute from the joint. Listen, Uncle Joey's Joint is brought to you by DraftKings today. It's NBA playoff time. Get in on the big hoop action with DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NBA. New customers, you're going to place a $5 pregame money line bet. And if you score, you're going to get 150 in bonus bets when your team wins. Who's better than you? Nobody. Plus, everyone can score with the no sweat, no game parlay every day during the NBA playoffs. Just open the DraftKings Sportsbook app, opt in, and place the same game parlay on any NBA game for $10. If it doesn't hit, you'll get a bonus bet back up to ten dollars so do me a favor it starts with you it's nba we got ufc and we got major league baseball download the sportsbook app today sign up with code joey new customers you're gonna get just put five dollars on a pre-game money line bet 
And if you score, you get 150 in bonus bets. Who's better than you? DraftKings. Do me a favor. If you got a gambling problem, call 1-800-GAMBLER. In Massachusetts, call 1-800-327-5050. In New York, call 877-8-HOPE-NEW-YORK. Eligibility restrictions apply. See DraftKings slash Sportsbook for details and state-specific responsible gambling resources. Thank you for all that. The bottom line is download the DraftKings Sportsbook app. Bet $5 on a money line bet and get 150 in bonus bets when your team wins. Stay black. Code Joey. We're back, bitches. Anyway, now back to now back to the thing people want to hear. And it's very interesting how we got together. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and it's funny because, like I said to you, I was struggling a lot with the book. Mm-hmm. I have a great book agent. His name is Gordon. And the thing I liked about him the most was his patience. Yeah. You know, he was very patient with me. Anybody else that I had spoken to about writing a book, they were always very go-go. He just kept telling me, just write a sentence a week. Mm-hmm. Write a sentence a week. And I felt like I was, uh, this relationship isn't going nowhere. You know, when you have an agent uh, for theatrical, you know, you have to go on an audition. When you have an agent for comedy, you have to go do these things with this book. I didn't know. I didn't even know where to start. I'm not a writer. Mm-hmm. So I didn't know. You know, I have I had aspirations of things I think I could do. Mm-hmm. Maybe I could write for a magazine. Mm-hmm. Get Sports Illustrated on the phone. Yeah. You know, <laughs> you're an idiot. So when I moved here, I was frustrated, you know, with the book. I kept putting it away. I think the last girl I was working with, that's the one that lived in San Diego and would come up on Thursdays or something. And, and I kept telling him, I go, listen, let's just do this for like a week straight so you don't have to keep coming up. Because you're not going to lie to me, dog. It's rough driving. It's rough driving when there's no money. I would give her money for gas and stuff, and I'd try to be, you know, take her to lunch when she'd come up. But after like six weeks, she just stopped. I stopped hearing from her. She changed the numbers. She would come to the house and hang out with me and Mercy, and the, the, and it just went out the window one day. And she kept everything she worked on. Oh, I think she sent it to Terry or something. Uh, she goes, I got a movie or something, and yeah. that was it. And, and nobody wanted to go the full distance. Yeah. You know, once they everybody could do it, but once they saw the meat and potatoes, they couldn't go the full distance. Two years later, I moved to New Jersey, and I'm at a family reunion with the yeah. uh, Florentine crime family, <laughs> who yeah. has many different <laughs> weapons. Like I've told you guys for years, they have different <laughs> weapons. And one of the weapons is they have a writer, and that's a niece, and we started talking, and and at first I'm like, she's too sweet for me to tell her these stories. Like, <laughs> this is not going to fucking work. She comes from great stock, her mom and dad are sweethearts. I mean, this might not work, but then I was like, wait a second. Our fucking uncles are crazy. <laughs> and yes. then Uncle Jim told a story on this podcast about the wrestler, the wrestling photographer that yes. grandpa was friends yep. with. And yep. they brought him over and he tried to molest Jimmy in the middle of the night. Yeah, Jimmy woke up in the middle of the night and his fly was open. The guy's like, hold on, oh. I'll make it better. I got these wrestling pictures. You can have them for free. <laughs> and then Jimmy's like, okay. But Jimmy told his uncle Bob and... Uh, Joe, yeah. your dad, and they went and beat the wrestler up, and they dropped him off on the way up the nine, that bus station right there. He goes, he still remembers them hitting him with the with the fucking newspapers from the box where you take the corner. And, and I'm like, if she could listen to that story, yeah, she could hear some of my stories. We're okay here. So yeah. it was like we started talking, and I tell you, the thing I remember the most is coming back from surgery and being fucking going to. Uh, PT, and they'd be mm-hmm. twisting my knee and shit. And finally, the guy would say to me, I don't know, if, are you taking pain medication before you come here? And I'm like, no. And he's like, you should. Yeah. We're twisting your neck. No, no wonder you're fucking yelling and screaming. <laughs> so I would take the pain pill before I went to the PT, and then I would come here a half hour later, an hour and a half later, and I'd be fucked <laughs> up. <laughs> <laughs> fucked up on those oxycodons, whatever the fuck they give you. And I remember being on the phone with her and between my gum being uh, swollen and the pills, I couldn't speak. I'd be like fucking slurring. I'm like, how's this girl catching all this fucking info? 
Did no. You record it? Like the phone yeah, I record. We, I would record them and I would take notes and then transcribe them as kind of my process when I'm doing books with people. Um, and I never even noticed, you know, like I didn't even know that was going on. And at the same time, which I'm always so grateful for this book in particular. And I've told you this because when we started working on this, I was going through a really difficult time personally. And I just needed something funny and positive as a project and it came at the exact right time I think it was like a month into me going through a pretty bad time you had called me and I well first of all I was freaking out because I I mean so many people are fans of yours obviously and I have so many friends who are obsessed with you and they cannot believe it I was playing your voicemail when you called to ask if I would write the book to my friends and everyone's screaming uh so we were all super pumped obviously I was too but every day even if I was having a really really bad day I knew you and I would talk and we would talk about some funny story from your childhood we would laugh our asses we would off. laugh so hard that. and I would just it would change my day around because it's different right like if I'm writing a book for somebody and it's about financial planning let's say you know going through a tough time personally and writing a financial planning book there's no change in mood right I'm just writing their book still feeling kind of cranky but with yours it was like not only would I get to hear the story and crack up then I would play it again because we had it recorded and I would go through the transcripts and I'm writing and still laughing it just it brought me a really good like sense of joy in a time that I really needed it so and for me the process was first off I, I was withdrawing on the Xanax mm. so my body was not well my anxiety level was not well I couldn't focus it was like a beginning of depression I couldn't make eye contact mm. you know I still tell people I remember my best friend in the world coming here and I went to eat lunch and I couldn't wait for him to leave mm. I, I, like you gotta go yeah I can't do this I can't make eye contact I don't want to hear what you're saying Ari oh, really? Ari one of my brothers i yeah. just couldn't have him around i was like when mike would come over we just did the podcast mike you gotta go like yeah. i just could not so i still remember and, and i don't want to admit this in public but i have to because i like to tell all my fucking dirty secrets there were days <laughs> where you know I, I until two weeks ago when i did the audio book i didn't know what the first couple chapters were about i was so done with anxiety i would get off the phone and go what did I just tell Erica? Mm. I hope I told her something pretty fucking good between the pain pills and what I was going through and the weed and the, I, there was something I didn't know. But I, my process for the book was I would sit here for two or three nights mm -hmm. and just make notes and then put them all together. And it was good for me at the time mm -hmm. from what I was going through. It was scaring me too because this all happened in Jersey. So I'm like, holy fuck, I forgot about this. What if these people come looking for me now? I'm in Marlboro. <laughs> so I still remember going out at night and smoking pot and going, am I going to get fucking shot when I'm out of here? Is there going to be somebody out there? Like, that's how insane the stories were, the Gabby story. Mm -hmm. And then it started, but we always, then it got to a point where we were telling stories with a huge payoff at the end. Mm -hmm. Like a laughing or like we couldn't believe it happened or something. And that was overwhelming. That was really overwhelming to go, wow, that story. Here for years, I thought that was a shitty story, but look how it ended. The ending makes up for what happened. So it was a fucking great process for me for what I was going through. Yeah. It was making me remember, you know, it was making me, it was, it was holding me accountable for the first time. And I had nothing going on. I wasn't doing stand up. Like yeah. I, I told Vinny's at Dino's and Uncle Vinny's, I can't even focus on stand up. Let me just do this fucking book. So it was like, it was perfect for us. It mm -hmm. was like two people meeting at the same time. And I didn't realize Ever. that till I actually read the book, till I did the audio book. Yeah. I didn't remember what I said on that book. I had no fucking idea. It was yeah. two years ago. <laughs> it so was a long years, time ago. Yeah, yeah. So for a year and a half, yeah. I've been excited about the book. Like we were saying, now we wrote the book. Now we got to wait. Because, yeah, we handed it in 2022. We handed the book in January 2022. Yeah. Yep. So, like, March last year, I was already like, 
I might as well get a copy of that book because I really don't know <laughs> what I was saying on that. You know, I don't know if, if, if we went off the deep end, if I told, like, crazier stories. And when I got the audio version, I was like, okay. Yeah. This is everything I wanted to be in here. And I, I got to be honest with you, it's got everything I wanted. To, there's a few stories that... I think we cut out because they're already on YouTube or something like that. Yeah. But it's got everything in there. Yeah. And there were a couple of things, I think, through the editing process with the editor that they said, maybe don't include this part. I know there were some legal things. Right. um, Stuff like that. But I, I agree. I think any story, Gabby is a great example. Any story that you're like, oh, you know, that was kind of going bad. It closes up nice. It's kind of. Yeah, we'll see, we'll see. No, well, the Gabby story ended up with him threatening to kill me next time he saw me. Yeah, and then you're out. And then I'm out. Yeah. And then I never saw him again. And then maybe seven years ago, my ex-family doctor called me. We were talking, and he goes, I bumped into your godfather. And and now it's like, how did it really end? You know, he's dead. Mm -hmm. And I miss him lately. Like, I went to the movies with my daughter Monday. Mm Mm-hmm. Because there was no school last week. And while we were at the movies, because we used to take me to the movies all the time. Yeah. I was telling him, I go, you know, I, I took her to see Air. And that's kind of an adult movie, you know, for a child. Yeah. And in the middle of the movie, she's like, Dad, where's Michael Jordan at? Yeah. You know, <laughs> Michael Jordan's not going to shoot. I, I, what we come here for? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and I was like, you know, Mercy, it's a story about Air and whatever. But on the way home, I said to her, when I was your age, I had somebody who took me to the movies. Mm-hmm. And I remember how powerful it was for Yeah. Me. You know, so Gabby lives in my heart still today. And I told her about Gabby. I would pick yeah. me up. I didn't tell him about the briefer and the fucking guns and the, the best was when he took me to see a live sex show. Oh, I didn't even know that. He knew, he knew like... <laughs> I did not know like that. like, three Spanish chicks. He's like, how funny. And we, we went to an apartment. It wasn't like at a club. It was like a, an apartment in Manhattan, a nice apartment. In Midtown Manhattan, I walked in. There's three chicks eating each other out in '69, oh and he's smoking pot, giggling, and I'm like six, playing with my GI Joe. And fucking so awkward for you. <laughs> awkward. Yeah. My whole my whole life was awkward at that age. Okay. <laughs> you learn how to focus like a motherfucker. <laughs> Dog, I don't want to see that shit. People eating each other out. I don't even know what she was eating. I'm like, what she? <laughs> What's she licking it for? What is that? That's not good. And that was the other thing that you can handle a lot of those stories because that that I also found was very rough on people. When you have to tell the honest, like I wasn't trying to make myself good in this story, in this book. Yeah, I never been trying to. I never tried to listen to kidnapping. You can't ever make good. It's funny. Mm-hmm. We giggle mm-hmm. about it. You know, yeah. last night somebody sent me a. A Club Nouveau album. Club Nouveau is this band. It's Timex. Look at all these rumors. They oh, yeah. take it no more. <laughs> it was like the early Timex whatever club. Yeah. Club Nouveau was a, an album, a, a band, and they had one particular song for the love of Francis. And I was dying this morning when I saw the album cover because it was my, in prison, it was Domino Night music (laughs) like you know like who can even say that they went to polka night in prison (laughs) like think of that word and how funny that is like that song reminds me of domino night in prison (laughs) like people like domino night what the fuck is domino (laughs) night i went oh i've never even been to a domino night that was on a regular thing (laughs) never mind in prison i go tuesday nights was domino night thursday was movie night and saturday was polka in the daytime, but they both called it poker night. <laughs> but who the fuck goes to domino night on so Tuesday cool. nights? <laughs> and they would be sitting there doing, uh, there was that song. They only had like three cassettes. So, you know, it's jail. It's not like you have DJ <laughs> fucking Willie up there yeah. slamming the 60s and 70s. They had three songs. They had Bobby Brown's new album, which is my prerogative. Mm-hmm. And then there's another song on there. Uh, I'll give you fancy shoes, whatever. Don't be cruel. 
how it be on that song. And they would slam the dominoes to the beat. Like, hold on, hold on. Bam! And they would slam the dominoes to the beat and then sing to each other. How will be that cruel to you? And it was domino night, you know. And I would fucking go there and just die with the music. Who could live their life and say that they went to domino night in prison? Yeah. You know, so <laughs> yeah. these shits, you just can't, you just can't tell this to people. You know, like with the kidnapping. If I look at somebody and go, "Listen, mm -hmm. I got to tell you something." On top of this kidnapping, that for a minute after the kidnapping occurred, when I was getting out of there, I took my gun out and I, I took two steps and I was going to go in there and shoot both people. I know for a fact if mm -hmm. I'm a female and I'm sitting with a gorilla like me, and some guy says that to me, after he goes, "Okay." We'll meet up tomorrow. Sure. Yeah. Sure we will. <laughs> yeah, you were going to kill somebody. You were going to fucking kill somebody. Now you want me to meet you? So I had all these yeah. issues like going into this. When is Erica yeah. just going to hang up on me? No. And you know what? It's funny because I, it's, it takes a lot for me to be shocked. And I say that because I started going to Uncle Jim's shows when I was Five? I don't know. Well, I, I'm curious. I want to ask my dad. They used to bring me to all the shows, me and Joey. And, I mean, we would just, I I'll always remember being maybe sixth grade, fifth grade, something like that. We went to one of the shows, and Jim Norton is telling some story about how he pays hookers to come and shit on a table a glass table above him and he lays underneath it and for me as a little kid like i i could not believe this but i, I still i wasn't even really shocked i was just like i can't wait to tell everybody like i went back to school and i told all the guys the you know my classmates wait wait until you guys get older this is stinky stuff you guys are gonna have to deal with i thought ever maybe every guy's gonna like that so i you know we would hear these stories and then i would just go back and tell people at school but like, nothing really ever shocked me and uh i it would take a lot for me to hear a story that i would be very offended by a lot i could tell yeah a lot <laughs> <You can call him. laughs> it you, would take a lot it's just really crazy yeah. that i i had a hard time it took me a hard time to tell these stories. It took me 30 years to tell. Like, I would tell Rogan or somebody, Ralphie May, or a comic I was on the road with, we'd be telling, I'd tell him a North Bergen story. But I would always, like, go back to my room, like, I don't know if I should have told him that. Yeah. You know? <laughs> so then when I started saying them on the podcast, the fucking funniest thing happened this week. I saw an old... You know, like when people get old memories? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I never saw this before in my life. A friend of mine hit me a message on Facebook, and he goes, hey, man, did you see that kid that reviewed your podcast? And I didn't know what that meant. I didn't see it when he sent me the thing. He just said, did you see it? Later on that afternoon on Facebook, I saw an old church thing with me sitting like this, and it was from 2014, and it said under it, growing up in Secaucus, New Jersey, People always told me that people from North Bergen were kind of crazy and to stay out of there. After listening to three episodes of this podcast, I will agree that people from North Bergen are basically fucking animals. Oh. <laughs> he wrote that. <laughs> he wrote that. And you see a bunch of people, my friends yeah. growing up, yeah. tell them to go fuck themselves, <laughs> fuck you and see caucus. <laughs> it's a fucking pig farm, you know. <laughs> you know. And it's like, all those little things always made me ashamed. Like, I was like, oh. But after I read this book as a whole, I'm like, no matter what happened in my life, no matter what happened, prison, whatever, one thing you can't deny is I got my money's worth. Yeah. <laughs> I got my money's worth. <laughs> and that's yeah. made me feel, ever since I've mm. read this book mm. and I've looked at it from that perspective, it's really changed me in a way. Like, you know what? I was feeling really bad about myself for years. Never mind the comedy, and the, I still feel bad about the daughter shit and the, mm. losing my parents. If if I told you no, I'd be lying to you. Yeah. But that whole thing, after reading that, it took me like four days to summarize it. Going, you know, I got a friend that thinks he's fucking Johnny successful, mm. and the truth of the matter is, he lived in his mother's house till he was forty. And then one day when he decided to grow up at 42, he bought a house two doors down from his mother, mm -hmm. you know? 
And with tight, I love him to death. But what a sad life mm-hmm. that he never left the block. I'm not being funny about this. I'm not trying to be cute. I just want you to really think about this. Mm-hmm. This guy worked hard his whole life and never left the block. And he had moms and he had a dad and he had uncles and cousins and nieces and nephews. And here I had none of that. Mm-hmm. But I had a full fucking life. I got my money's worth. Some of it wasn't to be proud of. Getting arrested is not to be proud of. But I tell you what's made me happy. Chasing James Coburn with Joe Rogan in the fucking car <laughs> on Sunset Boulevard when he was in an Acura NSX. We saw James Coburn in a light, me and Joe Rogan. We were like two young kids. It's 98. And I'm like, Rogan, tell me that's not James Coburn. You better fucking follow him. And Rogan's like, I can't drive that fast. You better stay on him. And we're chasing this guy. Who does that? Who could say they ever chased James Coburn down because they were that retarded about you? It's like, it's like you saying to me, dog, you're not going to believe this. When Nirvana came to Philly, I chased Kurt Cobain for an hour in the car. You're like, who does that? You had a full life, brother. People don't even think of doing that. And that's what it made me realize that. Yeah. What a shitty way to find out that your life wasn't that bad after all. And that's why a great friend of mine told me this, a great man. I think everybody should do this. Write about your life one time. You're going to be really surprised what you learn. Like, right, I'll never forget getting to L.A. and talking to this guy and him going, first thing you should do is write your life. Mm. Everybody, write your life. So you can really see what you didn't do and what you did do. And you'll put a tag on it. Whatever feelings I had. I used to be ashamed about being Mercy's father. That she's going to have to live with the things I did. And again, I'll tell her someday. Guess what I did do? I got my money's worth out of this motherfucker. I got left back. I went to prison. You know, I got an ingrown toenail. You know, (laughs) I got got my money's worth, motherfuckers. You know, so that's the biggest thing I think that I gotten from this book. And I... You said this from early on. It's a redemption story. Every, even the little stories. Well, I love those little funny things. Even just you running through the mall with them. People will see this in the book, but <laughs> going through the mall with the Bruce Springsteen. Uh, the records. Records and th- throwing them at a cop chasing you. I mean, there's just like so many funny things i don't want to give away too much about that story because it's really good but there's these are just tiny pieces of the book and (laughs) to me that would be like the standout thing i did in my life but like that was just one of your stories and it doesn't like it's not even bad it's just so funny and I think, I mean, there are so many laughs in this book, (laughs) so many. And, you know, I, by the third part of it, the comedy part, really start to see someone who is turned his life around. The comedy part isn't funny. Yeah, it's it's not. The comedy part isn't funny. It's not. It's when you start working. It's it's been fucking, it's crazy. Yeah. I think the, the story that got me from the book was, and I tell this on the podcast, people know mm. that when I smoke crack with the, when I smoked the angel dust mm-hmm. with the pregnant chick. Yeah. You know, I, I, come on, man. <laughs> Every time I think of that story, even today I go, come on, Joey. <laughs> come on, Joey. Come on, man. That is fucking crazy. <laughs> what do you want to see happen for this book? For oh. you? For, I'm really proud of you. I hope the world opens up for you, Erica. I really hope that. You know, I think I got another book in me. Yeah. Maybe in three months we'll start hashing it out. I would love to do that. I see a lot of great things happening for you. You did a really great job on this book. I'm happy I got to get it out there. I mean, I'm grateful to you. Thank you. Of course. And I think, I mean, it's just when people do a memoir, it's just a really brave thing to do. Like you put your heart and soul into all of this, putting the notes together, working with me, your willingness to share this with so many people because it's a lot. And I mean, people, I always think I would love to write my own memoir one day. I just don't even know. It takes bravery to really put your stuff out there. So kudos to you for that. I would say for me with the ghostwriting, memoirs are just my thing. Like I just, I've written self-help books. I've mentioned I've done financial planning, I've done business books, but 
memoirs are just what I love to do. I'll, I would ghostwrite memoirs for the rest of my life. I find it amazing. I find it fun. It's work that I wake up and want to do every day. So can't beat it. I feel like I finally found a profession that I'm like, this is it. This is exactly what I want to be doing. And a lot of people don't get that. So it's an opportunity people, to be creative. A lot yeah. of people don't get what they really want to do in life. Yeah. So uh, that's the number one thing. Scratching the surface to know what do I take like what you said. Mm. You grow up thinking, I want to be a cop. Mm -hmm. Can't wait. My mother was a cop. My father was a cop. My grandfather was a cop. Everybody was a cop. My Tony, my uncle Tony, before he went to prison, he was a cop. You know, everybody mm -hmm. was a fucking cop. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And one day you get up and you're like, ah, I wanted to help people. I didn't want to arrest people. Mm -hmm. Yes, you know? yes. Yes. Like That's exactly you, what it is. I didn't want to help people. I didn't want to arrest people. I didn't mm -hmm. want to help people. I wanted to arrest people. Okay, you're a cop now. But mm -hmm. it's just... Maybe you should have been a social worker. Mm -hmm. It's it's nailing down, and that is so fucking hard. And I feel the same way. There's no way I could have done anything else except for stand up. Mm -hmm. I don't. I, it was, yeah, you know, I'm worthless. I'm like tits on a boar. But <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's 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 uh, yeah, it's <laughs> it's uh, it's uh, it just works out. So I'm really happy. That you got a part of being my dream, and I got to be a part of your dream. Yeah, and, and here we are. It was the best. I the I I just I keep going back to this, but what a perfect time for that book to come into my life, into your life. Uh, we just had those few months that we were initially working on it. It just helped me get from kind of a dark place to starting to feel like myself again, and uh, I'm very appreciative. How can people find you? EricaFlorentine.com. Really? Yeah, ericaflorentine.com has some info on some of the writing things that I'm working on now and uh, how to work with me in the future. Like I said, I'm I'm really interested in doing more memoirs. That would be, if I could just go straight memoirs, that would be the most ideal life for me. Fun, happy, my true calling, I think. So I'm very proud of you. Thank you. I likewise. love you all my heart. I love you. I can't wait for our little party on Cinco de Mayo. I know. It's going now to be so fun. Now you got a picture fun. to hang. Yes. Cinco de Mayo thing. And uh, hopefully we'll get Mike up if he can make it up on a Friday Is that night. Rudy thing? Huh? Oh, I thought it was the Rudy show. What is Rudy's show? It was like that weekend. We gotta figure it out. Like the 8th, like the 7th or something. Oh, okay. Yeah, it, it, this is a Friday night, so I don't oh, think it's sweet. a Friday night. I think this is more of a, of a set. Of, yeah. yeah. I love you. Thank love you, you again. Love you too. Thank you. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Anytime. This is a fucking my pleasure. I love you motherfuckers with all my heart. Thank you for being part of the joint on Monday the 17th. Happy, have a great and happy 420. And remember, I'm telling you this right now. I got a gift for you motherfuckers on 420. It's a surprise. Get ready to rock. I love yous. And now for a word from my motherfucking sponsors. All right. I want to thank Eric All Florentine at ericaflorentine.com. And I want to thank you guys for the support and for always having my back. The joint is brought to you by, listen guys, it's 420 week. It's time to smoke till your fucking toenails turn purple. Get ready to smoke with the freeze pipe. The best. You smoke with no throat burn for the coldest, smoothest fucking hit from a freezable pipe, bubble, or bong with freeze pipe. The secret is the glycerin chamber. Pop that baby in the freezer for an hour and watch as your smoke is cooled by a 300 degrees. You know me, guys. I like all their fucking bongs, but this new tornado, oh my God. Listen, this is your opportunity to go to Freeze Pipe, thefreezepipe.com for the biggest sale of the year. And I'm not fucking around. And what I'm going to do is this. Either you take the Joey, the Diaz code at 10% off, or you get your own pipe with, with discounts of up to 40% on select pipes, bubblers, bongs, and more. So visit thefreezepipe.com and find your favorite pipe piece you follow me use something like you like i don't know if you want something that's on sale you got that if you want to use the dope the diaz code to get 10 percent off your entire order go there but remember that's the freezepipe.com use code diaz for 10 percent off or shop the 420 sale and it ends 420 the joint is also brought to you by liquid iv listen festival season's coming 
filthy people with her, herpes jumping up and down, stinking of booze and God knows what else. If they breathe on your neck, you're going to need to refuel. That's what Liquid IV has you covered. One stick in that desert, you get five essential vitamins and two times faster hydration than water alone when you're thirsty from all that ecstasy and MDMA you're fucking taking. Even if he has three times the electrolytes of traditional sports drinks and it comes in 12 flavors like strawberry lemonade, sea berry is fucking tremendous and the pina colada, oh my God, you think you're hanging out with fucking Jimmy Buffett. Anyway, my personal favorite, come on now, is the cherry and the Concord grape is fucking tremendous. Liquid IV has five essential vitamins b3 b5 b6 b12 and vitamin c they got all the b's covered it's also non-gmo and gluten dairy and soy free who's better than you liquid iv listen you get your liquid iv in bulk nationwide at costco or you get 20 percent off when you go to liquidiv.com use code joey at checkout that's liquidiv.com use code joey at checkout and that's 20 percent off anything you order when you shop better hydration today use promo code joey at liquidiv.com i want to thank liquid iv i want to thank DraftKings, and i want to thank the freeze pipe on this beautiful glorious week and you motherfuckers have a great week stay black and i love you i'll see you next sunday monday whatever the fuck tip top magoo